So first to all panelists, and uh, don't, uh, don't be afraid to like echo the thoughts of people before you or jump in <coughs> if people are running too long. I'll make sure nothing gets out of hand. Uh, with recent books such as The End of Men and numerous calls for a redefinition of masculinity, it seems as though society is telling men that they've lost something or that something about masculinity has become off, but no one really seems to know what exactly that is. So I ask all of you, have men lost something or has the world changed in a way we weren't prepared for? I'll try first. Um, I think, uh, I wouldn't say it has lost something other than possibly a need. Um, I. I I would most closely liken the present social situation to uh, somebody who has worked themselves out of a job. Uh, men have done such a good job as in the traditional role as protector, provider, and doer of stuff that there isn't a lot left that really needs a man anymore. And so we're, we're in this kind of spinning your wheels position where we're looking at well, what are we going to do now? Take a stab at that. So you're asking if if men have lost something. I don't I don't think men have lost anything. I think I think men are a complete package. We're born that way. Um, and but I think what society has lost uh, over the last several hundred years is is the processes that are used to to uh, turn a boy into a man. And um, you know when you look back in history, there's been uh, you know. It, Classic uh, examples are some of the tribes in Africa and some of the initiatory processes that they they take you through. You know, we we could knock out a tooth if you like, and that's how you know you're a, a member of the tribe as a full member now as a man. Of course, in our in our modern society, we've gotten a little more sophisticated about it. Um, but I, I think the thing we've lost are, are rituals and processes that that validate uh, a, a male's role as a, as a man, as as a as a legitimate uh, value member of society with with all of the benefits and all of the responsibilities and that's I think the thing we've got to recover we've got to recreate and we've got to implement with every single boy okay if no one if the other two don't have something to say on that um, this kind of naturally follows there are those who feel that masculinity needs to be redefined actively that traditional masculinity was and is dysfunctional the opposite view is the problem that uh, that the problem with men today is just that they have become disconnected from these values, right? So those values still exist out there, and if we could recapture that, the problem would go away. So what do you have to say about recapturing values that were traditionally masculine, like strength, courage, mastery, and you know, honor? All of these were outlined by an author, Jack Donovan. Uh, is it one, or is it both? Are those virtues out there, or do we need to redefine? Okay, nobody's answering, I'll try again. Um, I think those values are there. Uh, I think those values are there, uh, although they're not necessarily treated with any esteem anymore. Um, and I, I sharply recognize that there's a whole lot of different interests all saying we need to redefine masculinity. Uh, almost none of those interests actually have the well-being of men or boys in mind. They have their use in mind. Uh, and so I think it is uh, on men as individuals or a, as, you know, among themselves to come up with their own plan and not really uh, get sucked into uh, somebody else's false prospectus. Do I really need this? No. no. no apparently I do. Oh, of course. Sorry. Yeah, we're being recorded. Um, and this kind of answers uh, response to both questions because uh, I I, um, uh, I don't think that masculinity needs to be redefined. Uh, I think the essence of maleness uh, has not changed substantially in the last forty thousand years. Uh, but what uh, is is needed and is happening is that. Uh, as uh, my colleague here pointed out, the, 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 a lot of the ways that masculinity was expressed and was useful in uh, culture uh, have changed. And so what needs to happen is we need to find ways to redirect the masculine uh, values, masculine assets, uh, to, uh, to, in creative ways to, uh, to support 
the, uh, the culture that we find ourselves in now. And I agree that men have to do that actively because to fail to do so is to hand that over to uh, an element who, uh, who have defined masculinity as a pathology and they are going to, uh, they're going to repurpose masculinity out of existence. So th there is kind of an urgent call to action there. I had actually a question it, uh, from, I thought of it when you were giving your introduction. So you were talking about culture and change. What happened between the dad in Leave it to Beaver and Homer Simpson? What, what caused that change to occur? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the, dad in, <laughs> the dad in, I don't know if you've ever seen Leave it to Beaver, <laughs> but the dad in Leave it to Beaver was, uh, was uh, as um, uh, uh, unreal as Homer Simpson, quite honestly, uh, you know, it was a, it was a fairy tale family situation. Um, so uh, what has changed is that uh, uh, popular culture went through a period where they were uh, more and more uh, able because the a lot of the uh, a lot of the um, uh, uh, constraints that were placed on us by polite society were uh, eroded and removed and. Uh, uh, and so uh, pop culture was free to show a more realistic version, and then that realism sort of devolved into parody. Now that we've got the mic situation a bit more sorted. <laughs> so male aggression is something that's often demonized and framed uh, as completely negative. Um, it's cl uh, conflated with violence. Uh, rape, dominance, and all kind of chalked up to symptoms of male aggression. Has the role and value of male aggression been mischaracterized, or has it become unnecessary? I'll grab it. Um, I, I'm going to deflect the question by saying putting male and aggression together as if they're part of one thing is, uh, is, is a conceit. There is aggression, and sometimes it is expressed by people who are male, and sometimes not. So aggression has a social role. It has a role as a hunter-gatherer. It has a modern role. Uh, and depending on if you're socially functional or socially dysfunctional, your aggression, when you manifest it, is either productive or unproductive. And to say male aggression is to just put uh, a behavior that everybody has into a little box that you've put the word male on. And I don't think that's correct. Yeah, I agree with John. Um, but I think, yeah, it just like you can apply, you can apply it negatively, negatively, or you can apply it positively. Um, just like you know, when somebody attacks you, if you fight back, you're also being aggressive. But your aggression is, you know, wasn't something. Um, I wouldn't call it a negative aggression. It's some, it's a positive thing. Like there's, there's gonna be two forces, right? If there's a, a negative force, where you're being um, a victim of violence, but you're fighting against it. Your own violence against that, or the counter that violence, is not a negative thing. Like it's not the same thing. There's to say, um, you know, it's the, both people are being aggressive, but it's not the same thing, right? So you can apply it, and it depends how you apply it, basically. So, so when I usually see uh, quote unquote aggression uh, talked about in a, in a circle of men, it's it's usually uh, around shame. A man speaking about having hurt somebody um, and then sort of afterwards saying, I really didn't mean to. And um, y usually what, when we dig down a little deeper, we find that, and, and I've done this myself as well over the, you know, times, is that we tend to, to hide, repress, and deny things that are uncomfortable for us, situations that we don't know how to deal with, uh, times that we're angry, times that we're sad, and, and we just bury it. And, and that's, you know, been, for, for men, that's been one of the, uh, the greatest uh, skill sets that we've, we've evolved with. You know why? And, and people laugh at me when I say this, but for, for about a million years, us guys, we weren't in the hut with the women, with the kids, talking and laughing and communicating. We were in the woods, quiet, waiting with our lips zipped, waiting for dinner to come along. So we weren't communicating or practicing, right? But we're, we're trying to catch up now and, and learn a language of, of emotion. So the big challenge that men have is, is as they hide and repress and deny all this stuff, um, usually what happens is after a while, it's like, it's like a, a powder keg. They can't contain it. And they'll have a beer, they'll have a drink, they'll get drunk, whatever, self-medicate. And all of a sudden, it comes out sideways. 
You know, they're out of control and they hurt somebody, you know, and, and sure that man needs to learn control. He needs to learn how to process it. Um, but what's really coming out is, is bottled up emotions, you know, and I don't think we need, I don't think we should confuse that with something else, which is called strength or, or being assertive, which is an entirely other uh, skill set that men have. And that comes from knowing who you are and knowing what your values are and knowing what you're prepared to fight for. I actually have a follow-up question for you on that. So would you say that there's then different types of stoicism, right? There's a positive one where you're in control of your emotions and then a negative one where you push them down to the point where it explodes in a way you can't control? You're asking me? Yes. So, so my dad uh, had a, a rack of pipes, you know, and he'd get out his, his thing and he'd, he'd, he'd get this tobacco out and he'd put it in his pipes. And we weren't allowed to talk to him while he was doing this. And he has slippers on and his robe and all this kind of stuff. And I said, that's what stoicism looks like. He was kind of like just off limits, right, when he was smoking his pipe. And what, later what I found out years later, like probably 30 years later, I came back from men's retreat and I had a lot of questions about my dad, about my childhood and some of the wacko things I thought had happened to me as a young boy. And so I got a case of beer, sat him down and asked him some really brave questions. And you know what? It turned out my dad was actually meditating. Who knew? <laughs> so I think stoicism is one of those things you've really got to understand the, con the, the, the context of why a man isn't communicating with you in that moment. What is, what is, what is, why is he turned off? Does that get into your question or yeah. my off base? Yeah. No, that was, that was what I wanted to hear. <laughs> so uh, for Eddie, I have a question for you. Uh, how do you view men who are asexual and also how do you view men who uh, reject relationships as a dating coach? Have you run into anything like that? Um, maybe other than John, not really. No, I, I don't have a, I don't have an opinion on a, asexuality. I met a girl who once who said she was asexual, um, and that was my entire experience. Um, I don't have a negative opinion on either, either as well. Like I don't have much of an opinion at all on, on both of those topics. Like I've see, watched John's videos, and he has a lot of really valid points, including today. Um, I personally, I like relationships and I like dating. I love women. Uh, so I wouldn't go that direction, but I can understand the frustration a lot of guys have, uh, would, which would make you know push them to want to distance themselves from women potentially. And in today's climate, with a lot you know potential for uh, false rape charges and um, you know being demonized for sexuality and other th things like this. So, okay, well let's see to spark some controversy. John, what would you say to a young man who told you he wanted to get married today? Uh, I would tell him run. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, I don't want to, I don't like doing, I don't like the concept of rescuing people or, you know, telling them to do something that they don't want to do or not do something that they do want to do. But I would advise uh, any young man contemplating marriage to study uh, the Family Law Act very carefully um, and read the marriage contract very carefully and consider whether he would participate in such a thing. If this was just a business transaction with another man, never mind the romance sexual aspect of it, if you're just agreeing to do something inside a contractual arrangement, would these terms and conditions be acceptable in some situation that wasn't clouded by hormones? And I think the answer is no. OK, so. <laughs> Okay, so I have a question for Kevin. Uh, so is a measurement of one's manliness at all important in the gay community? Is it something that you guys deal with as well? And in your experience, is it a different set of values than straight men seem to have, or is it similar? That's, that's a pretty complex question. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and you'd get different answers from different gay men. Uh, masculinity is obviously a big issue in the gay community, and one of the one of the conflicts is: are, are we trying to model ourselves in genuinely masculine ways, uh, or are we uh, doing so because uh, we feel some pressure to emulate traditional masculinity, and and we. Uh, because we're all drama queens, uh, we take it over the top. Uh, we have uh, we have a lot of uh, of uh, game playing, um, uh, well, a lot of artwork, a lot of things that in the gay community that uh, uh, that really 
in many people's view, overemphasizes uh, masculine characteristics. And this is an ongoing conversation within the gay community uh, and, uh, and uh, certainly has its uh, resonance with the rest of the conversation. Thank you. Uh, so this is again to all panelists. Uh, how much of one's masculinity do you think is biologically derived and how much do you think is socially derived? Well, I, I, I think that the this is just my semi-informed opinion, is that, that uh, masculinity is, uh, uh, the, the basic masculine traits are hardwired, and that what is culturally uh, determined is uh, how, we, uh, how we culturalize ourselves uh, to channel those masculine traits. And I think a lot of the... Uh, uh, the controversies around those things are uh, as a result of a misunderstanding of that. So my daughter uh, is, is growing up now, but I remember when uh, I was the token dad at the moms and babies group, and I brought my daughter in, and there are all these kids, you know, they're like a year old or so, and they're scrabbling around the floor with all the toys at the daycare center. And what was startling was that the boys had the cars, and the girls had the dollies. And we didn't give them to them. They just went and grabbed them. And, and it was, I, I, kinda, I think it was kind of hardwired in, in some ways, although you know, a million years ago, we didn't have cars. We had horses, I suppose. What was interesting was, was that um, over, over time, um, you know, I've watched my daughter sort of go back and forth as to what really matters in her life. And I've seen this with, with boys and men that I know in my life as well, is that, is that I think it takes a huge amount of internal uh, self-knowingness to understand what resonates for you in your heart. You know, what, what, what excites you? What, what defines you? And forget about what society wants to define you as. And, you know, if you're a guy and you love G.I. Joe or heck Barbie, go for it. You know, and, and, and I think that's, that's where healthy masculinity comes from, is being, being grounded enough and, and confident enough and, and uh, feeling like you have value to be whoever the heck you are. I'm good. <laughs> OK. Um, for John. Do you think a man can willingly choose the provider role, or do you think it's always a case of not having made the like made a rational decision? Um, yes, I believe. Of course, you can willingly choose the provider role. Uh, I am just somewhat skeptical of the 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 wisdom of doing such in uh, a legal climate where there are so few um, legal protections and there's a, really quite a negative suite of expectations and assumptions. Uh, and so I just, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not going to say you can't choose it or you shouldn't choose it, but, well, actually, I am saying you shouldn't choose it. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I have to steer this line where I don't ever want to tell somebody not to do something that they want to do. Um, I just sometimes question the wisdom of it in our present legal and social climate. OK, so this is to all panelists. Who are some good role models of masculinity that you've come across in a, out in the world? <laughs> one of you has to have one. All right. Well, I do, but it's such a cliche. <laughs> my father, who was 98 years old and is still my hero. <laughs> Sorry if that wasn't heard. Uh, it, it is kind of a cliche, but uh, yes, my father, who's 98 years old and is, is still my role model in many ways. Yeah, I'd second that as well. My father as well, um, big role model, built his own houses on his properties, uh, developed a lot in his life. Um, but for somebody who's well known, I would say Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? He's very successful. You know, people laugh, but very successful guy, very ambitious, right? From uh, the beginning in his life, you know, yeah. He and immediately he took on a very kind of masculine, um, on a ma very masculine sport, which is bodybuilding, which is just kind of exaggerating the uh, male musculature. But you know, he went from there to movies and business and even in politics. So I see that ambition as being a very uh, in a, a positive thing as well, but a very uh, masculine uh, sort of ambition. Uh, 
there's a, a piano player uh, who's dead now, uh, who's from the former Soviet Union, and uh, his name is Vladimir Horowitz. I see a few nodding heads there, yeah. Virtuoso of a guy. I would not put him up against Arnold Schwarzenegger for an arm wrestle, but man, that guy could play piano. He was totally in his, in his groove, totally uh, at one with his creator as, as he played. And, you know, like Michael Jackson. I mean, yeah, I wouldn't put, I wouldn't put Michael Jackson up against Arnold Schwarzenegger either, but, but th there's something about being in the zone and, and, and communing with one's uh, innate energy. And I, I, to me, that's very sexy as a man to see that. that I can make short enough, so. <laughs> okay, um, how do you personally define your masculinity? Are there specific traits that you've tried to grow over your life or specific ones that you've tried to diminish? <laughs> Go for it. Confusion, right? <laughs> that's, that's, that's such a difficult question. Um, I, I don't try to define my masculinity. Uh, I just do what I do, and I say what I want to say, and, I, you know, I'm aware that I am a masculine man in my own way, but uh, to try to define it is, um, I think that would be self-defeating almost, because I'd have to try to create some sort of a container to put it in, and, uh, and I'm not sure that's uh, productive. I kind of uh, agree with that. Um, I, I, I've never thought about my masculine traits versus my non-masculine traits in terms of what I need to work on, what I need to improve, what I need to get rid of. I think more in terms of my human traits, some of which are traits that people would choose to describe as masculine and some as feminine. Some of them are positive, some of them are negative, and over the decades I try to identify the ones that are negative, that are having a negative impact on my life and in the lives of others and, and get those under control. But I don't think of them as masculine or feminine traits. I think of them as human traits. That's my answer to you. <laughs> <laughs> I've never had to think about it at all, actually. I kind of mentioned in my speech, um, it's just a biological, biological fact, right? I'm a man. And uh, naturally, you're going to be inclined to do certain things that women aren't going to be inclined to do, right? Some women may be. Um, Going back to what Corey said about the babies not choosing the trucks and the dolls and, and the uh, daycare or whatever, uh, that's been shown in studies as well, even for uh, baby primates. They'll not, eat, like a monkey, like what, what does a monkey have to do with a truck, right? Uh, but they'll still pick the trucks over the dolls based on their sex. And I think, you know, I haven't had to think about being a man other than for coaching purposes, you know, I, I kind of define it for that and for uh, an event like this where we, we talk about it and intellectualize it. But I, I know that naturally I'm just going to be, you know, my interests are going to probably be male inclined, but it's not something I, I'm choosing on purpose just to be more male or more masculine. Right? Let me take a, a stab at this. I, I don't like characteristics. I, I don't like labels, really. Um, however, uh, Carl Jung uh, years ago came up with this idea of archetypes. Anybody in psychology here studying this kind of stuff? Yes, you know what I'm talking about. And so if, if we are uh, a collection of, of different voices going on in our head or different different urges, uh, we could chop them up into pieces. So in our in our uh, men's organization, we, we use four of them that are the easiest to get our heads around. The king, the magician, the warrior, and the lover. So if you think about it, um, if, if our job as a man is to just try to balance those energies, to try to be the best king I can be, to try to be the best warrior I can be, to try to be the best lover, to try to be the best magician. If I can somehow roll that wheel and keep it moving and you know not fall on my head, then I'm going to be a pretty whole man. That's kind of the approach that we work with. So it, it seems to me that all of you kind of agree on the idea that enforced gender roles are a really bad idea and that if you're trying to be a man, you're kind of doing something wrong. You should try to be the best person you should be, but trying to put into a label of these are the things I shouldn't do isn't helpful. Is that kind of along the lines of what you're all saying? Yeah, more or less. I mean, there are certain th things that you shouldn't do, like hurting other people, mm -hmm. but other than really obvious stuff that, other, like that, yeah. Other than the things that apply to all people. Like there's no specific stipulations you'd say that men should do. Well, 
trying to answer that in any kind of concise way is just um, it's a minefield. So uh, I'm just going to I'm just going to say I don't know the answer. I think based on abilities, people, again, men and women are going to have natural strengths in certain areas, and you can't force that either. Like, I don't think gender roles should be forced, but we're going to naturally fall into certain positions. Most men are going to naturally be more dominant in a relationship, right? Um, just like in, in a homosexual relationship, there's usually a top and a bottom. There's still sexual polarity there. There's differences. One person's going to be more uh, dominant, another person's going to be more submissive, just naturally, generally. Uh, you look at the military, and uh, U.S. military in particular, there's been uh, where they pitted men against women. The men always did better. They had a, in, in New York, I believe, they actually had to lower the standards for the fire department to allow a woman to be able to pass to make it in. So, you know, obviously some women may want to do that, but it was obvious that men were better at the tasks in the tests that they were being. Uh, um, challenged with to be firemen, right? So I don't think it's a matter of forcing people to do something or not. I think we're just going to naturally uh, fall into our strengths. The, the, uh, the issue of, of, of what men do or what our skills are or our, our, our traits, I, I, I look at relationships as being the crucible uh, for a man to learn. Uh, about himself, basically. Uh, I'll give you, give you a for instance. So, so a woman very sweetly and gently sat me down and explained to me years ago that when she was telling me all of her problems and I was actively listening and, and being non-judgmental and all that kind of stuff, she did not want to hear a solution out of my mouth. Why? Because the first thing I want to do is, well, you should just do this. right? I knew how to fix her, her problems just like that. And you know what? She absolutely hated that. But my men's guys love that, you know. So I had to learn what what a new skill set, you know, to be to be with that woman. The other issue is, of course, that uh, women say they multitask. Uh, at least in my world, the women in my world tell me that. And most of the guys in my world say they don't multitask. And so there's a, there's always a disconnect uh, when I have uh, men and women together in a situation. It, it, it seems like we're we're sort of um, desperately trying to grab a hold of each other, but we're spinning off in different directions. So I think. I think self-awareness is probably one of the biggest uh, tools a, a man in 2016 could have. Speaking about men in 2016, uh, what do you see as the biggest age issue facing men today? Age issue, you say? The biggest issue. Oh, the biggest issue. Suicide. Suicide. <laughs> Um, well, I, I come, for those of you who don't know, I was for many years uh, active as a, a men's rights activist that despised class of uh, social misanthropes. And, uh, you know, so I have a fairly encyclopedic knowledge of, of, of the, all the different men's issues that are sort of current social, legal, um, and economic di issues. And so it's a hard question to go, well, which one do you put at the top of that stack? And the reason I say suicide is you have to start looking for the reasons for why men kill themselves at such a high rate. And once you begin to examine the reasons, you will find, you know, you'll, you'll end up going where your interests take you. But suicide is like, a, it's like the canary in the coal mine. It's the, it's the symbol that there's something quite profoundly wrong, uh, a really deep set of problems. So that's the end of life. I guess the, the other side is you could look at um, infant genital mutilation at the beginning of life, which is seemingly still perfectly acceptable as long as the child you're cutting is a boy. Um, I'm going to back it up just a bit, but only partly, because I think there's a, a connection. I, I, that's a, a bucket of cold water on your right. Suicide is um, a serious uh, problem for men, uh, the disproportionate number of men who take their own lives. And, and that's reflected. Uh, that's also a, a major issue and not an often talked about one in the gay community because a disproportionate number of suicides, especially among young people, are, uh, are, are gay-identified uh, young people. But 
Because you brought it up, and because we, you, I mean, we talk about the hardwiring of certain characteristics that are male and certain characteristics that are female, uh, I'm not sure that you can completely compartmentalize it between dominance and passiveness. And you use the example of homosexual relationships where there's a top and a bottom. But if you, if you look into that more carefully, you'll find that in that community, or at least it's been my experience and observation, um, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a, a great deal more nuance to it than that. There are a lot of, of men, uh, and I'm speaking now of, of gay men, who uh, identify as tops, uh, who are, um, uh, who are uh, much less dominant in other aspects of their relationships. They're, they're, that identity is a is a sexual identity, and uh, and I know I know drag queens who are tops. Um, I, when I first discovered that, I was kind of shocked because I too had this sort of all these stereotypes to deal with, and maybe in maybe this is there's a clue here to uh, the conversation about. Uh, uh, redefining or rechanneling masculinity is to recognize that there is more nuance and we, 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 if we push back against stereotypes with more stereotypes, maybe we're just going to run in circles. Jesse, you ask a really good question. So what's, what's the biggest issue of men in, in 2016? Um, I don't even. I don't think this is just a man's issue. I think this is every every human being in the in in the technological world's issue. I think it's isolation. I think the biggest problem that we have is we have the illusion um, that on our cell phones, our smartphones, through Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and Instagram and all these things, that we are having deep and meaningful relationships, and that through those 140 character tweets or posts or whatever we're doing or clicking like or sharing whatever, that we think that we're actually processing our 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 inner issues um, and growing, and and I think that is the farthest from the truth. Um, and I'll tell you why. Because, um, you know, if, if you were to sit in my men's group, uh, sorry ladies, you, you can't, but uh, you guys, if you were to sit in my men's group, um, you, you're going to have another man look you in the eye and go, bullshit. Occasionally, right? And he's going to do it with love. He's going to do it because he knows there's more to you than what you've just said. That he knows there's a truth inside you that's, that, that's just lurking under the surface and that you're just scared to say it. But you're not going to get that on, on the web. You're not going to get that on, on your smartphone. Or if you are, you're just going to unfriend the person. So I, I think the biggest issue we have is we don't have, through our modern technology, the ability to temper boys into men. I just don't think we have it. You mentioned women. Do you think that women can benefit from taking on healthy, masculine, traditionally masculine values personally? To all of you, if you're going to say. Pass. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> All right. So the question, so can women benefit from taking on more traditional masculine roles? Yeah. Like, like, for example, give a specific. For example, I mean, like, if you think that assertiveness or dominance or stoicism were important masculine attributes, do you think that a balancing of those things, that we may have been separated into two artificially created poles, but do, do like men have benefited from releasing that stoicism in certain ways and being more connected emotionally? Do you think women can also benefit from moving towards the center and adopting those traits? It depends on the context. Because if a woman wants to be successful and she wants to make lots of money, that's cool. She's going to have to adopt masculine uh, personality traits in that area of her life. But that doesn't mean she wants to be like that in her relationship. Like that, I had an example earlier um, in my speech of a man I consulted who uh, lost his marriage because he took the back seat. And uh, his wife was a, a successful businesswoman. Uh, she was like a type A personality, like ambitious. But she, and she told this to him, she didn't want to be the man in the relationship. But she did want to be the man in her, you know, so to speak, in her uh, business life because she wanted to be successful, and she was. But in her relationship, it was a totally different story. So it, just, it really depends on the context. Women could benefit from that. And, and that, that's actually what the move is right now uh, in society. And that's really what feminism is pushing, is ma making ma women more masculine in their behaviors. Right? Um, it's not, you know, feminism isn't, definitely is not about being feminine.
Yeah. If I can just sort of come at that at a different angle. Um, I, I, I will state for the record that I don't speak for women. I don't know anything about women <laughs> other than what the women in my life have taught me, and I, I'm very grateful for that. Um, what I have seen, though, what I can observe with my eyes is I have seen some women who have taken the time to look at themselves and to figure out uh, the energies that are inside of them and to, to work consciously on, on balancing their own energies. And those women, I find, are the, are the most beautiful, the most powerful, the most successful, uh, and the most um, uh, generous in, in our society. And, and I, I'm, always, I'm always following them around. I want to I have a cup of coffee with them, right? Because they're, they're amazing people. And I, but I, I think that's the same process that any human being does. Uh, we all have masculine and feminine energy in us. And, and I think if we, if we leave something hidden or, or, or undeveloped, I think we're not only hurting ourselves, I, th I think we're actually, uh, you know, selling the world short a little bit. I, I think that that, that question, uh, whether women can benefit by um, adopting or, or cultivating traditionally masculine attributes, uh, also speaks to the point I made earlier about nuance. Uh, an example just sprang to mind. I, I've worked most of my life in the arts and culture sector, which is very much dominated by women and very much dominated by strong women. Uh, and one of the strongest, most domineering women I ever uh, knew uh, was a very dear friend uh, who ran one of the larger festivals in Vancouver for many years. She was the executive producer and she was, uh, well, she was a ball buster is what she was. And, uh, but, and she was a lesbian. And uh, she was identified as a femme. But uh, she certainly had and cultivated and used very effectively a lot of traditionally masculine attributes. And I worked with her for quite a number of years before we became good friends. And I met her partner, uh, who was the butch in her relationship. And I was, uh, I was shocked the first time uh, 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 her partner, I don't know, told her to do something or said something, and, and my friend said in a small voice, yes, dear. I, you know, I don't think it's all or nothing, all one or all the other. Okay, uh, so how much change, because you all kind of come with this with different perspectives. You work with individuals, you work with individuals, you two seem to be more on the societal level of talking about issues. How much change do you think needs to happen on the individual level, and how much change do you think needs to happen on the societal level to address these issues? Oh, that's an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll try that one. Um, I think that uh, the societal change only exists as a byproduct of individuals making changes. And you know how many are making changes? Are they all going in the same direction? Are they going in different directions? Um, so when you look at uh, you know breaking it down, either societal change or individual change, uh, those those are you know too closely related to each other to say you can sh can do one first and then the other or anything like that. So somebody asked me the other day. Um, are you are you in the in the men's movement? And I said, "There's no men's movement. What are you talking about? It's an unmovement." And 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 what I mean by that is is that um, men don't typically get out of bed in the morning and go, "I'm going to fight for men's rights." We don't. We don't. At least I've never met anybody like that. Maybe there's a few of you know uh, people in in the university who decide to do that. But but for the most part, the men that I meet in in everyday life are men who have hidden and repressed their, their pain for as long as they possibly can until their life starts to come tumbling down. It crashes. They lose their job. They lose their income. They lose their spouse. They lose their kids. They lose everything. And why? It's because they were unconscious. They were asleep. They weren't evolved. They, they were a little boy. And, and so you ask, how big is the change that, that needs to happen? Um, I don't speak about society, but I speak about for that man. And we've all been there. I've been there. Um, that change is profound. That change changes everything. But it's, you know, it's for, for the brave man who, who finally says, OK, I need help. Okay, I'm I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Okay, I don't know everything. Okay, I'm open. I'm 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 willing to risk and hear something different. I'm willing to break my silence for that man. That could be the most significant thing he ever does in his entire life. Thank you. 
Okay, so I, do you have something else to say? Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to um, slightly object to that, just a little. <laughs> um, I, I agree with almost everything that you said, uh, except the part about being asleep, that men who uh, go through this trauma, losing their families, their jobs, their lives, their, their con concept of themselves, yes, I totally agree that happens, and I deal with a lot of men as well who, who have gone through that. I don't think it's because they were asleep. I think it is because they were socially disallowed from engaging with themselves, experiencing anything other than a very narrow set of emotional expressions that, are, that conform to what you're allowed. Uh, and the problem is that they aren't that simple, narrow, defined thing. They are as broad and complex as anybody else around them. Uh, and being forced into that stricture, um, I suppose, can be seen as being asleep. But I think there is a large uh, social pressure that pushes them into that. And there is a, you know, there's a, a certain degree of uh, courage required to step outside those boundaries. So yeah, I, it's only a partial disagreement, but it's, it's whether or not it's um, being asleep or being uh, constricted socially. Anyone else want to take a stab or? Okay. Uh, what would you say to a young man who's interested in getting involved with men's issues but is reticent and afraid of the consequences or of being called a misogynist or some other slur? Right. <laughs> I would say educate yourself. There's a lot of information out there. I, I'm astonished every time I read a book and go to the uh, the bibliography and find more to read and uh, and and learn about uh, these issues and formulate uh, arguments that will give you strength in the face of being called a misogynist. Yeah, for me, uh, you have to develop strength. It's just uh, it's another challenge in life, and if you back down from challenges, you're going to become weak. And it, it, life is a lot more difficult to deal with if you're scared of everything. Uh, even a conversation with John earlier, he was saying about how the videos he made have had some effect on his work, or maybe he gets haters or, or whatever. But he's like, yeah, you, you know, he's not exact words, but you b basically you just bite the bullet. And um, you know somebody has to do it, right? Somebody has to step forward and uh, and uh, take a risk. I think I think if a, if a man is is contemplating, what did you say, getting involved with men's issues? Yeah. Yeah, I've never met a man like that. Um, I, I I think I think if a man is is sitting there thinking, gosh, there's got to be more to life than 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 what I got now, um, I I would ask him to to dream a little bit. I would ask him, "What did you come here for? What, what's your point in being on this planet? What, what, what are your, what are your natural talents? What, what do you, what do you want to be proud of in ten years, in twenty years? What do you want on your grave? What do you, what do you want them to be saying about you at your funeral? You know, and because I, I you know, I come from a long line of of men. You know, going back." generations who, who all in their own little way did something amazing. And you know what? Every man in the room is exactly the same here. Look to your father, your grandfather, and your great-grandfathers. Who are they? What did they do? And, and, and find something amazing about them. Because why? It's in you too. And so when a little boy comes along to you someday and says, what does it mean to be a, a man dad or, or uncle or brother or cousin? You can say, I want to tell you a story. Give them something to dream about. So we're running about to the end of our uh, panel discussion, but I think for the last question, I want to ask the whole panel, if you had one piece of advice to tell men today to improve their life by the, most, um, the biggest amount they could, what would it be? Uh, toughen up. Don't be so sensitive. But basically, you know, that's what it comes down to, and that could work for women as well. Um, you got to be strong in your own life. You're going to encounter challenges. People are going to oppose you, especially if you're public. 
um, and you have to learn how to deal with that. And you know, I don't mean suppress your feelings. I just mean you have to learn how to deal with the uh, what comes your way and not have, not explode because things aren't working right or whatever. You have to. You know, take steps, educate yourself, uh, and put yourself through training, whatever kind of training, whatever that might be. It depends on what direction you want to go in your life. Yeah, well said. Toughen up. Um, easier said than done. So what I would say to, to a man is uh, come sit with, uh, in circle with us uh, at the Mankind Project. Uh, risk to tell your truth. Risk to learn a language of emotion. Uh, risk to learn who you are so you can get the strength uh, to be attractive, to be bold, to create the life that you want. Um, I'll be hanging around here afterwards. If anybody has any questions about that, you can find the Mankind Project at www.mkp.com. P.org, that's mkp.org, and we run a weekend adventure called the New Warrior Training Adventure if you want to really jump in and get going. Thank you. Uh, my advice to any young man would be to be very skeptical of all populist positions. I'm not saying they're wrong, but to look at everything that is the majority viewpoint with a very skeptical eye and a, a rational evaluation of, is this true? Um, and, uh, and then make your decisions from there independently. Well, you kind of took the words out of my mouth. I guess what I was thinking in terms of was uh, my many years experience as a journalist and my advice to young journalists is just not to not believe everything that you hear and everything you see and everything you read, but don't believe anything that you hear or anything that you read until you've looked into it for yourself. Okay, so we're going to have a quick break for about 15 minutes. Before we do that, I'd like to remind you all that we put on these events with the uh, meager allowance that the SFSS is willing to give us, and we fund it out of pocket when we can't do that. We are grateful for every donation, be it a penny, be it a dollar, be it a congratulations or a thanks for what we do. So with that, we will meet back at 8.15 to have the Q&A section of this event. <laughs>